Hey everyone, I'm Scott Branley. And I'm Alicia Coakley. Every member of the church has a story to share, one that can instill faith, invite growth, and inspire others. On today's episode, we're going to hear how one man's lifelong pursuit of music is helping to show others that when we connect with the Lord, our talents will be magnified through Him. Welcome to Latter-day Lights. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Latter-day Lights. We're so glad you're here with us today, and we're really excited to introduce our special guest, Andy Lloyd. Andy, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing wonderful. Yeah, just just got done with a good service and just thrilled to be with you both. And uh, you, you both are very nice. delightful. This is, this is a lot of fun. So We know it. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're kidding. humble, too. <laughs> yeah, we're really humble. Uh. <laughs> oh no well this is this is the this is off we're, we're we're recording later than normal tonight so i think we are a little delirious <laughs> yeah, i think that's what the problem <laughs> is like absolutely yeah. that probably is this is fun nighttime scott and alicia no <laughs> yeah party oh, party scott and alicia <laughs> oh. anyway andy welcome <laughs> we appreciate you coming on tonight because when when um we actually had uh, Colton from, let me get the name of this right, the Center for Latter-day Saints Arts. Is that right? Yep. Absolutely. He reached out to us and told us about you. And when I first read the email, I was like reading kind of fast. And I heard, I read Andrew Lloyd and I filled in Weber. <laughs> You're not the first. Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Weber? Yes. <laughs> so I had yes. these high expectations and i was pleasantly surprised to find out that it's andrew lloyd who is hilarious and so you guys our guests don't know that yet but you're really funny and I, i'm really excited about this podcast i, I think it's going to be a really good one and we're excited to have you well on. just so. just to throw something in there once upon a time i was set apart in an elder scorn presidency as andrew lloyd brother andrew lloyd weber and I actually had to stop the blessing and say, "Hey, we, I, think, I think we gotta I gotta get this fixed here." Uh, and I started, I That's started so singing funny. "Phantom of the Opera," you know, just started throwing it out there. Right. No, yeah. I've gotten that so many times. Like, it's, oh, it's so nice to have Brother Weber in the ward. I'm like, what? Mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. See, if if it were me, I would take it as a financial opportunity, and I would just start charging for my signature. <laughs> just be like, yeah. "Would you like me to well, sign I your mean, baby?" <laughs> A dollar. Right. Well, and what's crazy is we're both music, like I'm a composer. Like that's that's what's crazy. But right, Andrew Lloyd Webber is the yeah. man. I mean, that guy's written some of the most incredible music. Like I, I just I hope someday, <laughs> maybe someday I can yeah I can throw it down like him. But but that guy's awesome. So yeah, I was I was gonna say when you introduce yourself and you say, hey, I'm Andrew Lloyd. Do like people like pause and wait for you to say Weber at the end or. <laughs> Sometimes, but so I actually on my on my music I put S Andrew Lloyd, and oh, and so okay. everybody will ask me. A lot of times people ask me like, well, so I always get the Weber jokes, but the, um, but then every once in a while people ask me like, what does the S stand for? I was, I'm always like, Sir, uh, Sir Andrew Lloyd, and man, they they lose it. They think that's the funniest, <laughs> the funniest thing. But it, yeah, it doesn't stand for Sir. Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> so what is the S for? Uh, Stephen. Oh, okay. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, gotcha. Yeah. So, Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, I I love I absolutely love music. So that's music is my life. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it doesn't it doesn't take the place of you know my my love of faith and family. I've got a, a beautiful wife and four beautiful daughters. So I'm a proud right. girl dad. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, wow. but, um, as far as my profession goes and as part of, part of what I'm deeply passionate about is music and I teach, uh, uh, actually organ. I, I'm an organist. I teach organ, I'm a pr professor of organ and composition at university of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, I'm going up for tenure this fall. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get tenure, but, uh, I love teaching the students and inspiring them. And, um, I love writing music. And I love performing. So I've performed all over the world. My music's been performed all over the world. Um, 
at the Cathedral de Notre Dame de Paris. It's pretty cool, right? La Trinité in Paris wow. as well. South Africa, wow. Ty- Taiwan, Russia, Ugh. the National Cathedral. So my music's been 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 performed all over the place, and so it's just a real honor. And, and soon, actually, at Carnegie Hall, and which I'm I'm super excited about. That's how we kind of connected a little bit because I have a piece being performed there by uh, Rachel Willis Sorensen, who is li- just absolutely one of the top most wonderful sopranos in the world. Mm. I've, just absolutely stunning. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm deeply honored. I'm just deeply honored to be here uh, and, and to be able to, to talk about faith and music. So. That's awesome. Oh, so yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? You have the, the concert at Carnegie Hall is going to be April yeah. 9th, right? Yep. So are there tickets still available for those who are able to get there? I know it's, you know, it's not too far away, but uh, like, what do they do if they want to go and they want to check out your music there and, and check you out? You were awesome. Morning. What a great question. Yeah, absolutely. So April 9th is the concert, 7.30 p.m. If you go to the Carnegie Hall website, if you just type in Rachel Willis Sorensen in Carnegie Hall, and it will show up. And yes, tickets are available. Um, I, I'm, I, I think, yeah, I think there's plenty of tickets still available. So, Okay, awesome. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Andy, why don't you uh, go ahead and kind of take us along this journey? Like, let us know how, where did this passion for music begin and how has it, you know, really helped you in your life's, your life's journey, your life's purpose and stuff like that? Um, You know, where does your story start? Oh my gosh. Uh, There's so much I can talk about today. So, but I, I really feel like my musical journey Oh, it's, it's really about family. Um, and I have a deep reverence for the sacrifices that my family has made throughout their lives. My great, great grandpa, Niels Christensen joined the church in Denmark in 1857 and one and came across the plains in a wagon. Um, and, uh, several generations later, uh, my grandpa Christensen married a wonderful woman named Lois Gordon. And, at some point in their marriage, they got an inheritance for about two thousand dollars, which back in those days was probably enough to buy a car or something more. That is a lot of money, mm-hmm. and they decided to use that money to buy an, a house organ. And I like I <laughs> really I I played on that organ, and it, you know it's had like you know it had like the buttons you push that has like a bossa nova beat, you know, and it uh-huh. had like only had like eight pedals of the pedal board, but Grandma Lois taught anybody who wanted to, to learn how to play hymns for church, she would teach him. And so she, she must have supplied, su- su- supplied her ward with tens of organists, but most importantly, organ was part of the home. <laughs> and so, so my mom learned how to play the organ and actually took organ lessons at BYU, Idaho and um, studied with um, the late Darwin Wolford up there and really took to it. And so when I was born, there's some fun, it's funny stories here. Uh, she, my mom bought a $75 organ with this massive speaker with tubes in it. I don't, I don't know if mm-hmm. you guys are old enough to remember tube speakers. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how those stupid things work, but it's this massive <laughs> refrigerator speaker basically in our front room. And man, I love this organ. It had this like awesome tremolo. And then one day she goes out and decides, does something crazy and buys a $4,500 organ and brings it home. And I had the nerve to say, mom, why did you do that? I like the old organ. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> 4,500 bucks on this organ. And I wanted the $75 one, which is just <laughs> funny. And, and I got, he was to say, I may have been in just a poquito trouble. I'm from Texas. I probably, <laughs> anyways. So, um, so yeah, I grew up, I started the organ. I started the piano when I was five and the organ when I was not, talking really fast the piano when I was five the organ when I was nine and my mom was my first teacher and really I feel like she gave me the foundation like she gave me the core of who I who I, I've ever been as a musician and um and so I took organ lessons till I was 17 and then for my mom and then at, at some point she decided she says Andy, do you want to do jazz or do you want to do organ? So I said, I want to do organ lessons. And I, so I got a professional organ teacher in the community. And um, I remember my first time walking into St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Cathedral in Spokane, Washington, this massive English Gothic cathedral. 
this big, beautiful organ. And my eyes just got about that big because any, any organ I'd ever played on was our little electronic toasters that we have at church. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to make fun of them. They're really, <laughs> they're, they're, they're beautiful. I they're love efficient. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but anyways, my, I was sold. And so from then on, I must have just two or three hours a day and I just loved it. I got, uh, I got, I got into BYU and uh, chose to go to BYU for my undergraduate. I, I got offered awesome scholarships at University of Washington as, well, Washington as well, but went to BYU. And so, yeah, so at BYU, I studied with um, uh, my professor, Doug Bush. I'm, I don't, I, I'll just drop his name because he's, I'm going to talk a little more about him later in, in, in this as he passed away of cancer. And I was asked to write, or I was asked to do an honorary performance in his memory. And I wrote a piece in memory of him. So. He, he was really influential for me. And uh, I did organ for four years and just realized, hey, man, there's no money in this. I, I need to go get a real a real job. I, I know that I'm probably offending a lot of musicians when I say that. So I, I did dentistry for two years. And um, I got a in the 98th percentile on the DAT. And I got a 3.9 chemistry GPA. And I didn't get accepted into one single dental school. If that's oh just why I don't know what it is. And so at that point I, I realized like, well, somebody, am I, am I supposed to be doing something else? And I had just gotten married to my incredible wife. Who's been so supportive because she married a dentist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'll have a moment, moment of silence. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm not a dentist, uh, by the way. And, uh, this is a, a cheap suit, uh, just so you guys know. That's, um, <laughs> But no, she's, she's been just incredibly supportive and cheerful through, through having to go through a lot of, a lot of fire really to try to get to a point where I can have my music performed at, you know, by some, some incredible performers. And, and I've worked really hard for that, but I've also felt called to do it. It it was early on uh, after doing dentistry and kind of coming face to face with what am I going to do? You know, like I didn't get accepted. And, Mm -hmm. And I also, I'm like, do I really want to work in someone's mouth the rest of my life? I've been spent, I've spent my entire childhood in massive cathedrals. Mm. Like I, that's what, that's what I was meant to do. And all I, during the whole time being dentistry, all I could think about was composing. Like I, I would envision these beautiful cello solos to hymns that we do in church. I just, I was just constantly mm-hmm. swirling. I never had done much composition. I'd, I'd, I'd written some, some fugues. <laughs> If, uh, some Bach like fugues that I, I was really proud of, but that was about it. But I could t- tell that I was I was always creative. You know, when I was younger, I painted a lot. I drew Air Jordan shoes because we never had enough money to buy a pair of Air Jordans, so I just draw <laughs> them anyways. <laughs> you know, so I loved I loved art and, and creativity, and I wrote I wrote <clears> some <throat> music. And my friends in high school would always ask me to pick off songs off the radio, so I would go to like seminary and parties and play Smashing Pumpkins or green day and stuff like that on the piano. So that I, like, I, I was <laughs> nice. into, I, I arranged stuff and I, I was into that kind of thing. But anyways, to go back to this point in my life, when I didn't get accepted in any dental school, I remember just at, at, at a, some point uh, I did, my mother-in-law is a psychologist and she gave me a test to say, what, what would you be passionate about? And the professor was kind of at the top of the list. I'm like, professor, I'm like, I don't want to do that. But then I started thinking about it. And it wasn't too long later, I was at an a organ concert, the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake, which is one of my favorite venues. I was just asked to do a performance there this last year as part of um, a, a festival in, in Salt Lake City. But I was at this concert, and one of my good friends came up to me after the concert. He says, you know, I had a dream about you last night. I said, oh, yeah? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing when you hear that, right, Scott? And, yeah. um <laughs> And anyways, I, he said, yeah, I had a dream last night that you were a professor. And I said, what? Wow. And, I, and so at that point, I decided, you know, I think maybe the Lord's teaching me. And I am so a glad. A little bit of a because, two by four to the face, right? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm, that's what I am now. I, I love being a professor. Like, I love, like work with the students. The journey really opened my eyes to what my what I feel like my real calling is. In, in music and that's creating music mm-hmm. and my passion is creating music that uh, brings people to Christ and that kind of solidified when I was at my master's studies at University of Kansas I, I was able to study with 
an incredible professor, Forrest Pierce, who's a dear friend and just always been so supportive, but he was also very religious in his music mm-hmm. and, uh, and ascribes to more of a Muslim uh, uh, philosophy or theology. Um, but he opened my eyes to, to a composer, John Tavener, and I read his book, The Music of Silence. And John Tavener was really uh, was a Greek Orthodox composer and very into the mystic and writing music, that concert music that was focused on Christ. And of course, I always loved Bach and, and studying with Dr. Douglas E. Bush at BYU. He really opened my eyes to, to Bach. Everything Bach wrote, he wrote Soli Deo Gloria at the end of it for, for, the, so for, the, or for the glory of God. Mm-hmm. And every time I'd hear these things, I just seemed to be drawn to writing music. And of course, I have a deep, just incredibly deep testimony of Jesus Christ um, through personal experiences in my life that maybe I can talk about later. But just, I have a, a just, I felt his atoning influence in my life and I felt him close. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there came a point where I just, I wanted to be that. I wanted, like Bach, like Mendelssohn, who, whose Judeo-Christian beliefs permeated his music, like Elijah and Paulus. And he even wrote a piece called Christus. Yeah. Um, Franz Liszt wrote a piece of Christus. At the end of his life, he wrote only sacred music. Franz Liszt was like the great, one of the greatest piano virtuosos of all time. Olivia Messian, who's deep abiding Catholic faith ends up in his music. I just at that resonate with, with me. And so everything I write is for the glory of my God. And that's important to me. Uh, that's just, that's what I'm passionate about. And, and it fuels me. Um, and so, so that's kind of uh, being at university of Kansas is when the seeds of composition really started incubating for me. And I started writing mm-hmm. more music in about 2008, 2009, it's when I wrote my first large scale piece. It's an organ piece called The Three Bins about the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Garden of Resurrection. It's an organ solo and it gets performed mm. a lot all over the world. It's it's a really um, well performed piece of mine. And then um, um, after University of Kansas, I went to University of North Texas where I got my doctorate. And I continued my composition studies alongside my organ studies. So all of my degrees are in organ performance. And so, and um, yeah, and then I got a job at University of Texas in San Antonio teaching organ and composition. So uh, that's kind of yeah. the, the the Cliff Notes version of my, <laughs> my, musical, my musical story. So anyways. Wow. That's crazy. So, so you didn't really know necessarily that you were going to go down this path of being a professor, but also being a composer. Right. Yeah. So did you just kind of, I mean, how did that look as far as like, did you just kind of like take the next step and, and be like, Hey, Heavenly Father, catch me if I'm on the wrong track or, or did you feel like you were like guided to the next step, you know, each time? Absolutely guided. Yeah. So, um, when I went back on the journey, I, I hadn't done organ for a couple of years. And so I reached out to the professor at University of Washington and then University of Kansas was also on my radar. And I, and I kind of opened the door and man, once I started getting back into it, doors just opened, just felt right. And so I just mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, kind of walked through that door. And then I, when I was at um, University of Kansas and uh, I, I remember once I had just a baby. And so at the end of the semester at, in work and performance we do what they call a jury so at the end of the semester you have to perform about 30 minutes of music or 20 minutes i can't remember what it was and unfortunately i hadn't practiced a whole lot because i wasn't sleeping a whole lot because i had a little baby keeping me up <laughs> at night and she's adorable she's cute as baby and she's adorable now she's 15 now which is, which is crazy and um and so for that jury i decided to just improvise something <laughs> So I, I played like one piece of music and I improvised a, a, an arrangement of child of, of, of the hymn, I'm a child of God, but in a very uh-huh. modern style, it's, it's kind of, you can actually, I don't know if I have any recordings of it, but they, the professors went nuts. They said, I didn't know you were a composer. Well, you need to take composition lessons. I'm like, okay. And so they got me hooked <laughs> up with Forrest Pierce and really Forrest Pierce changed my life. Like that, that's when it really opened up to me, just open the door. Like I'm telling you, like, I had no idea what I could do as a composer and he mm-hmm. helped me see like he, opened eyes. you know, sometimes I feel like life is like a big dome 
and there's a, mm-hmm. there's a little there's a little d- light at the top. You can see there's something up there, and you get up there, and there's a key. You open the you open, you go up through that little light, and, and there's like a whole other world for you. And you're yeah. in another dome, and then there's a whole other world beyond that. And it's like I think that's what <laughs> life is like. like. Sometimes you don't realize what your potential is. And once I climbed up through that hole, like I just exploded, and and man, I just I love it. Like I love writing and um. Yeah. So, so yeah, the doors kept opening. Right. And so with each piece I wrote, like I wrote the three gardens about basically about the fall, the, the, the atonement and the resurrection of Christ. And, and, and I depicted all of this through, through music. Right. And so with mm-hmm. my next piece, I wrote a piece called the mountain of Elisha, which was, which is really about, um, I wasn't planning on talking about any of these pieces. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. Talk about the ones I want to talk about. But it was about um, Elisha's eyes being open, right? The servant of Elisha asking like, what What should we do? And then his eyes were open. He saw chariots of fire so, and horses and, and, and all covering the entire mountain. And and th- he said, those that be with us are more than those that be with them. So I depicted that through this music, this musical firestorm. And it's, mm. and I just performed that actually that piece at University of Florida for the first time in like 12 years. And so it was, they loved it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Wow. And so with each new piece I write, there's, there's, a, there's, a, um, I have this, this imagery in my mind of like walking. Like I, I remember vividly on a scout camp back when I was, was younger climbing, um, Mount David as a scout troop and, and this, is, this is in the cascade mountain range and standing on the top of the mountain and seeing, I could see Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens. So I have this vivid imagery of like, I, I'm, the world is so noisy, right. And um, there's just so much chaos and, and clutter and the buildings are square. Everything is just, it's just, and so I have these, this vision of being, you know, in a valley and looking up and seeing mountains turn. And, and for me, I have lots of mountains that I ain't climbing. Like there's a lot of mountains that I should be climbing, uh, that I'm like, not today. <laughs> I'm going to go eat my yeah. burger. That's one of them. Um, but I want to <laughs> climb it. I do, but I got to work on it. But, but music, I feel like there's a voice calling me from the top of the mountain, hmm. uh, as if I have a purpose that, that, that God wants me to write this music and that, that he's appreciative that i want to glorify him and yeah. so you see yeah. that glimmer of light coming from the top of the mountain and you look ahead and all you see is just a, just a canvas of trees and steep trails and and you climb the mountain and so with each new piece that i write usually by the time i get to the top of the mountain it's it's incredible and i experience the divine in in many ways but a lot of times when I get there, I realize that that I didn't do it myself. That God was walking with me the entire time, and not just helping mm-hmm. me, but like chatting with me, you know, and giving me a little yeah, bit of right. help. You know, I had to do it, but He's like, "Hey, buddy, you know, like, what do you think about this?" <laughs> you know, like I feel that. Like I feel like, and 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 none, I, I no other experience have I had this more. Then with a piece that I was compelled to write right at the end of my doctoral studies at University of North Texas, I just graduated and I had no job and mm-hmm. except for a church job that I had in the community. And I just, I don't, I can't remember when it started, but I felt, I felt, I just saw writing a large scale piece, an hour long piece about Christ. And I, I was drawn wow. to the Christus statue at Temple Square. Christ with his hands outstretched with the worlds, the cosmos behind him, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it was kind of cool because my one of my favorite artists is Jake Kirk Richards. And when I finished the piece, I was on his website and noticed he's working on a Christus statue at the same time I finished my Christus piece. And I remember doing a wow. Facebook post about it. And one of my, a, a person I never met in Fort Worth, Fort, Fort, Fort Worth, Fort Worth <laughs> reached out to me and said, I've got a Christus, I got one of those J. Kirk Richards Christus statues in my house. You got to come over. So I went over there. It was the coolest thing. But anyways, I, I was drawn to the Christus statue and, and drawn to, to writing a full scale work about Christ. And it was hard because I probably, you know, 
the world would say, Hey, you got to get a job. Like you got to take care of your family. And I did, I don't worry. Like the Lord took, this is the cool thing. The Lord took care of all that for me. You mm-hmm. know, what we had to live without, we lived, we lived right. I'm done my doctoral studies. We're living in a garage apartment, 900 square foot apartment with three kids, four kids, yep. sorry, four kids. Wow. It's crazy. Oh, it was tiny. And we were, you know what? We were happy. Like our garage had a swing set in it and the kids would always go down there and do on the swing. And we had what we needed. <laughs> there were some hard times. There were some hard conversations being had. And there were a lot of people around that were, were saying, Hey, maybe you should be not doing that. Like maybe you should be doing something mm-hmm. else. And I remember feeling a lot of um, adversity in writing mm-hmm. this piece. And early on in the process, the music came to me. Like it just flowed in, in, in this, and the texts came to me. And um, essentially it ended up being a mass, uh, a Catholic mass. And I was, tr- I was drawn to this because um Several years earlier, I just felt strongly like I, I tried to create what was my mission statement? Like what who who was Andy Lloyd gonna be? Like in especially music was such a big part of that that it really quantified and solidified into um I wanna write music that endures time, continues to bring people to Christ even after I leave this world. Hmm. And that sounds a little epic, but I felt str- I feel good about it. And but and to do that, I, I I so I had to figure out well what why do we still engage with music today? Like what are, what are we still engaging with? All right, mm-hmm. um, and and for me, like I love I love rock music and pop music and that kind of thing. But but I haven't listened to the Beatles since I was in high school. Like like there's certain things mm-hmm. that we don't engage with over and over and over. Now that might be offensive. I apologize, Scott. If that's <laughs> offensive to you. I don't know. Oh, well, he just called what, you what old. What Canadians like? But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, but so, so for me, like what, like I was, I'm going back to Douglas Bush. I remember listening in his house for Good Friday. This, I mean, this is the season right now, right? We listened mm-hmm. to Johann Sebastian Bach's St. Matthew's Passion, which is a three hour monumental oratorio about the passion of Christ as, as, as dictated from the book of Matthew. Mm-hmm. And I remember this moment when, when the music says he gave up the ghost and, and the music just went silent. And I remember just, mm-hmm. just felt the spirit so strong. This is a German piece, a Lutheran composer, has nothing to do with Mormonism. And yet I am, mm-hmm. the spirit is communicating with me. Mm-hmm. Gosh, a couple weeks ago or a couple, uh, last year, I was listening to, to Claudio Monteverdi's Vespers from 1614. It's an hour and a half long piece uh, that has a bunch of psalm settings and ends with the Magnificat, the 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 the, um, the text from Mary herself that says, "My soul doth magnify the Lord." And I'm sitting in my car, mm-hmm. 400 years later. I'm listening to this piece of music, and I, it moves me to tears. It's this mm-hmm. moment when the, when this treble choir, this just just boys and it, um, little kids, children, sing this mm-hmm. gorgeous line. With with these two tenors from opposite sides of the cathedral in St. Paul's Cathedral, and and echo with each other while you hear this angelic voices over the top of that, and I I'm sobbing. And so I asked the question, well, what what kind of music do I need to write that might endure time? And so I came up with some parameters. A lot of the composers we still listen to wrote epic works, big works, like they they, they wrote works that that like Handel's Messiah, right? That's a classic mm-hmm. one that we still engage yep. with today, hundreds mm-hmm. of years later. Um, they write virtuosic works. Most of these are concert composers. Not We're not talking, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's all sorts of kinds of music. But those are some things that I discovered. Like, I've got to work on this. But here's the deal. I'm 30-something years old. I'm not Bach. Bach was writing this stuff when he was 10. Mozart was writing mm-hmm. this stuff when he was 12. Mendelssohn was writing this stuff. He died when he was 40, and he had more music than I could ever dream of writing. <laughs> So I'm climbing a mountain. Like this is an uphill battle. This is this is Joseph Smith, 14 years old, kneeling in the in the in the sacred grove, asking which church to join, mm-hmm. and completely unprepared for what was coming next. <laughs> you know, and so so it's been difficult. So ch- at times, because you feel the imposter syndrome, you feel like I don't belong, mm-hmm. with Bach or Brahms. Mm-hmm. Although my kids, one f- more funny story. I remember once I had a piece being performed in Dallas and, and they were doing an advertisement for it on the radio. 
Mm-hmm. And, and so I turned it up. I'm like, guys, look, dad's on the radio. <laughs> My little girls were like, wow, dad, you're like the third greatest composer of all time. And my first <laughs> was, my, my first thought was like, oh, no, no, no. Like, I'm not even the top thousand. But then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, who's, who's ahead of me? <laughs> so, you know, I was like, I want to know who's ahead of me. And, you know, they were like six or seven or something like that. And they were like, oh, it's, it's, uh, I think they said Bach and Brahms. I was like, okay, you know, that, that's, that's, I'll give you that. <laughs> so they, they actually said the right answers. Cool. So, so according to my daughters, I'm, I'm the third, but anyways, you, it's, <laughs> you have, you can't compare yourself to those composers. Otherwise it, it weighs you down. It's it, mm-hmm. it, it discouraged. So you have to, you have to push that away and, 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 and push that darkness away, those clouds away so that you can, you can have the peace to allow your mind to be open enough to learn what needs to learn, to write mm-hmm. music that might someday belong. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And my music might not, my music might not ever make belong, but I'm never going to stop trying <laughs> because that voice is still calling me. And, and, and it's my offering. It's, it's, I'm giving everything that I possibly can. And yeah. case in point, I'm going to come back to peace in a second. This, this piece, Amaranth, this piece I wrote called Amaranth. It's a collection of five art songs for Rachel Willis Sorens. That's getting from more premiere next week. It was the most challenging time. Like I, I'm telling you, I had so many things weighing me down just to push everything aside to write the piece. When I mm-hmm. finished, I was so exhausted. I, th- I was like, I'm never going to compose again. Like I just, <laughs> my mind just wants to explode with creativity and I just want to just let it go. But then I got to go do emails and I got people over mm-hmm. here and I got this and that. And I, I just can't get, I can't clear everything away to just write because guess what? I got to provide for family. I've got to right. magnify my calling. I got, I got things that are also important and it's right. been amazing to see even what little I can offer, how much the Lord magnifies it. Like he literally mm. touches it. And I feel like every piece that I write, it's, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for music. I'm grateful that mom kept me going in music because it's, it's allowed me to connect with God and to have something in my life that humbles me, that makes mm-hmm. me, that forces me on my knees where I'm, I got to get a piece written next week and the heavenly father, I cannot figure out this movement. And it forces me on my knees to just plead. I know I'm, I'm not the best person. I probably shouldn't have watched the show on Netflix last week. I should have been writing this instead, but I need your help. I really need your help. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I get up and and magic happens. And then 10 years later, I look at the piece and I realize I never wrote that piece. Like the Lord really picked me up in the dark, in the dark time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, like I said, I feel like I'm kind of all over the place, but this, you know, this brings me back to Christus is, is, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to come back and just talk a little more about that because to me that was kind of my the, the premier mountaintop experience for me in my life. Andy, as you as you get back into that, you were saying that it's an hour long, right? Yeah, the piece. Yeah. How do you how do you even start to tackle something that's an hour? Like it, where do you, that just seems yeah, that's overwhelming I'm... just to say though just to say that it's an hour. You know, yeah, like, I was wondering the same thing. And like, it, it, like, is it kind of like a, um, and I, I forgive me, like, I, I'm not cultured. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you're doing just fine. It's okay. <laughs> I know. Like you uncultured swine. That's what I feel like right now. <laughs> but, but uh, is it is it like you're one, I guess, do you really study the stories? It, do you kind of take pieces of it and then put is it one whole long nonstop set in little scenes? Almost like you would see it like the opera or something. I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Actually, that's that's that's. I mean, for an uncultured. No, just kidding. No, that's actually perfect. I don't know if I could have explained it better. But yeah, that's it's actually nine scenes. So it's it, we call it okay. movements, but but I love the, I love the term scenes because that's really what I'm depicting through the piece. Okay. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So with Christus again, it was kind of that again. I felt like if I wanted to have something that, that might be performed in 200 years, like I needed to think somewhat bigger because at the, at this point I'd only just written kind of lots of piano pieces, choir pieces, organ pieces. So this was the biggest thing I'd ever tackled 
and I didn't realize how much work was going to be. But yeah, I, I started again. Again, I had this idea of like having a piece that's completely focused on Christ with his hands outstretched. So like, yeah, so I started with the research. Like, what does that even mean, right? So I went to the Bible mm-hmm. dictionary. Hallelujah. That we have a Bible dictionary, right? <laughs> and looked up at the topical guy, just looked up hands. So I just like looked at a bunch of stuff about hands, right? And I don't know when it happened, but at some point, and I, and I actually have a book. Um, well, it's right here. Look at that. How fortuitous. It's a fantastic <laughs> book, by the way. Uh, it's, a, it's translations and annotations of choral repertory. Yep. Those are just a lot of big words. A lot of big <laughs> words. <laughs> so I like I love ancient music, and so I'm really I was really drawn to Gregorian chant. So I love like, old mm. old because to me that music gets the closest to Christ. Like I don't know I don't want, I don't mm-hmm. know if it is, but but I if 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 I wanted to figure out what music sounded like at the time of Christ, like I got to go as far back as I possibly can, right. and then go a little further. So right now mm-hmm. I'm actually doing a lot of research on Byzantine chant and how it's done. And it's because that's even older uh, chant, mm-hmm. but it's just so different than modern music. So like, I love finding like other texts from, from other church, like from, from the his, antiquity, because I have a huge reverence for the offerings that people gave back in the 1700s and the 1400s and the 1200s, you know, that this is what they had, this is what they knew. And they gave everything mm-hmm. to the Lord. And I have reverence for that. So I started looking at so mostly biblical texts. Um, and then I eventually, some point I settled on, on using the, the Catholic mass as kind of a, as, as a center point for this piece. So the, the Catholic mass formally starts with the Kyrie eleison, and there's usually some sort of Gloria. We probably, you've heard probably a Gloria or something, Gloria in Excelsis, Deo, Laudamus Te. There's mm-hmm. a lot of tradition. There's a lot of tradition with this. Most major composers, in fact, Bach wrote a He's called the B minor mass. Like it's very common to write a mass uh, for for serious for serious composers, right? So there's a Gloria, there's an Agnus Dei, there's a it's not a Sanctus, but there's a and then that piece ends with the Hosanna and Excelsis. So, anyways, I'm writing a, a piece that's that's based on Catholic a Catholic formal musical structure, uh, and I, here I am a, a good a good faithful Mormon boy. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 of course i love my church right i love the book mm-hmm. of mormon and and i and i and so i kept thinking well, i want to incorporate incorporate third nephi 11 into this right mm-hmm. so i've got you know i've got you know so so then you start asking the questions of, of, of how how do i depict things and of course i'm a good mormon boy i love isaiah 53 right he was bruised for our iniquities he was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes we are healed that's such a great i mean we, we love that those that script right so mm-hmm. so i'm infusing this piece with rich mormon theology right and um i remember asking the lord at some point i said hey like, why am i doing this because i probably should be a better mormon boy and write an arrangement of you know the morning is you know uh whatever spirit of god or something mm-hmm. and i remember the spirit whispered to me that that this this church is is the restoration but it's it's a church for all all people, mm-hmm. you know that that my ancestors were Lutheran. Well, they wouldn't have known the Spirit of God. Like they might know a Bach chorale, right? They might have heard mm-hmm. Herzlik Tuchnik Verlangen, which is another piece that I wrote. Um, and so I I, I I envision I'm speaking to all I'm speaking to Latter Day Saints, all of all like all backgrounds, right? That's that's. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of was, again, it was one of those moments where I feel like I kind of went through that dome and saw a whole nother way of thinking about the music that we write in our church, um, you know? And, and yeah, I don't know that my music will be performed at the tabernacle anytime soon, but I think maybe a couple hundred years, maybe it will be, and it'll be special, you know, but, and that's okay. But I, right now my music gets performed in cathedrals and by other faiths. Christus was performed by a completely non-LDS choir. We had two people in there. And they came up to be actors like you're a Latter Day Saint. I'm like, yeah, yeah. They're like, we saw Third Nephi 11 on the score because I put the scriptures on the score. Like, we saw Third Nephi oh, really? 11. I was like, yeah, it's so cool. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so yeah, so I, I compiled a bunch of biblical texts, and then I, and then I, I mostly infuse those with the Latin text. So, so for example, the first movement is Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, and basically with that movement, I place Christ in Gethsemane. Um, 
Christ in Gethsemane suffering for our sins. And at that moment, it opens with this beautiful baritone solo. And, he, and the baritone sings in, the, in, in representing Jesus, Kyrie eleison, which is Lord have mercy. And we, mm. we recognize that. So I'm using this Catholic text, which is actually Greek, by the way, Catholic text to paint a picture of Christ in Gethsemane. And then, at, and then after he sings that, the choir comes in and sings Christ eleison, which is Christ have mercy. So we're pleading for him to do this, mm-hmm. right? And then over the top of that, you hear the choir singing, my Redeemer liveth, and his hands are outstretched still. Mm. And it, as I was writing this piece, I started to feel like I didn't want to do a piece that was chronological, like here's the birth, here's the ministry and the death and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, right? I was intrigued by this idea that these could coexist together. And what what kind of discussions open when you hear my Redeemer liveth and his hands are stretched out still? over the top yeah. of this you're, 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 like you said we're, we're setting the scene and the mm-hmm. scene is christ in gethsemane it's as if the mm-hmm. resurrection already happened right and as right. i was doing this I, I spent a lot of time on my knees in prayer to understand like what this doesn't make any sense to me why am i doing this like i, I just write the music i just it just let it flow mm-hmm. and um through some beautiful spiritual experiences, it was opened to my eyes, just the infinite power of the atonement, that it's timeless. It goes backwards in the time that people who lived before Christ could experience the power of the atonement before it ever even happened. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that the idea that these coexist on top of each other, it actually works. So for the fifth movement, for example, is the text, um, he was bruised for our knees. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we are healed. And while the choir sing that in English, the choir is also singing, et resurrexi, et, 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 et a in shevin, which is he was resurrected and on the third day he ascended into heaven. Wow. And so you hear this, this idea that Christ, when he ascended into heaven, it, it, there's this weight of what he just did that we always – at resurrection, where I was always praise resurrection, right? Yeah. But I love the idea of this humble resurrection, this idea that Christ was ascending with the weight of what he had just experienced. Wow. And I can't, it opens the discussion, yeah. right? To ask the question, yeah. ask the question, what, what is he really feeling? Mm-hmm. And you start to, to feel more the love that he has for us. And the sadness, like I, I feel thirty five seventeen when he has to leave, and he says, "I perceive that you wish to stay," and he stays just a little longer. It depicts that, you know. Right. Wow. Um, so the Hosanna Shelshis is to me just the most powerful movement in the work. It's about eleven minutes long. It's the piece that ends the work, and it's the last of nine movements. Oh, there's so much more I could talk about. I have like. 15 pages of notes about this piece. Like I could go for hours about it. And and I feel like when I listen to it, I'm still being taught. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier that the Lord magnifies our offering. Like when I go go back and listen to it, I'm learning new things. Like I'm reading the scriptures. I don't want to compare my music to the scriptures, but it's the only thing I can, only way I can make sense of it. You know, when you go back to the scriptures and you hear something and it just sounds different the second time, it feels that way. But this last one is called Hosanna and Excelsis. And how do you not hear Hosanna and Excelsis as a Larry Saint and not think of, Third Nephi 11, right? So I knew that this was going to be a part of the puzzle, but again, it's in Latin. It's Hosanna and Excelsis. And, and one day, I don't know what, how it happened, but at some point I felt like I needed to make this piece in the seven sections, representing each day of Fishin. Now, I'm a science guy, so I'm like, I don't understand the creation. I love it. I love the temple. I just I don't get too worked up about it. And I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a guy like I want to learn about all the other stuff. But I believe in a God who can create the world in seven days. I believe in a God who's all powerful. So I just decided to go with it. I'm going to go with it. And if my friends make fun of me for writing a piece about the creation, I don't care. So I wrote it in seven sections, and it opens with this massive E flat major chord. Now, if you know the key of E flat, it's three flats. Three flats, it's according to Bach, Bach used the key of E flat to depict any piece referencing the Trinity, in our case, the Godhead. God the Father, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ, and the Son. So in the opening movement is light. In the last three movements before that chord, 
which I'm more into, like it's that with the strike that that was wood. It's it's all weighty. It's very mm-hmm. it's very subdued. And you hear mm-hmm. this chorus. It's like fiat lux. Let there be light. Let there be God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And then and then the music gets wild. You have to listen to it, audience. You can just go go to the 50 minute mark in the piece and go listen to this video. And okay. the, the organ's going crazy, and you can see God's face moving along the waters. You can just see it. And and then I and I depict I depict the um, the sun, the moon, and the stars and, uh, through three sections. And then it ends. Um, it ends. So this this is all the Latin text was on it says whatever whatever whatever, and it, and it builds this cataclysmic moment. I wanted to pick the chaos before you heard the words. Behold, my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased to read. Heaven, in the loud, bountiful, twenty-five hundred people were there and heard this voice. And so this builds this chaos, and it comes down, and it's just quiet. And the choir, the choir sings with the pianissimo, just a quiet, subdued voice. Behold, my Son. And the very next text you hear, about a minute later. You hear Christ say, "Behold my hands," and I love this imagery. There's nothing in between. It's just, "Behold my son, behold my hands," and it's as if you see God saying, "Behold my hands." Like you see the unity. You see the unity of God the Father with His Son Jesus Christ. Now I can't come up with this stuff. Like this isn't me. Like this is, you know what I'm saying? Like this is mountaintop stuff. This is the veil is thin. And I don't even know what's going on because the veil don't look very thin to me. Like I'm looking ahead of me. It's just a big white wall. Like, but, but my mind is saying otherwise. My mind is, gets it. Yeah, and, I, well, and I then, love, behold, behold my hands. Cause it's God, it's God's hands. Christ are God's hands. But then Christ is also standing there before them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But not just because, guess what? I dropped this text in a piece that is depicting the creation. So mm-hmm. this is just, oh. here's hands, come touch them and know that I I am the God of Israel. It's mm-hmm. behold my hands that created you, that created right. the universe. And then the choir builds, it's just glorious. It's just this massive Mahler, Gustav Mahler, who built these epic Browse. This is massive, just builds. And if you watch the video, people in the choir just bawling. And then at the cataclysmic moment, there's this moment where just this distance just builds and then it just resolves to my son. So it's, it's just like, behold my hands, my hands, my hands, behold my hands, behold my hands, my son. Mm-hmm. And in this moment, like I just depict it, I feel like I wanted to depict Christ in glory. Mm-hmm. But every time I hear that, I hear God speaking. You're part of this too. Well, and that's the prayer. I wow. pray that they may be one as I am one and you and, and, and I are one together. That's the prayer mm-hmm. that he wants us to be a part of. Yeah. The piece opens, this last movement opens with Hosanna and Excelsis of praise. But we never really talk about what Hosanna really means in, in Hebrew. It's a cry. If you read definitions of it, it's a cry. It's a plea. Save me, oh God. And it's, really? it's and so the piece it the piece ends with the choir singing with quiet tones, Hosanna and Excelsis as the piece piece fades and the violin soars and you see Christ ascend into heaven. And the piece ends with this beautiful B flat major chord, which I've heard described, and this is how I feel. It's like a warm blanket that God left. Mm. He still loves us. He's not leaving us. And man, we finished at the premiere at a Presbyterian church in Fort Worth, a Latter-day Saint composer with a non-Latter-day Saint choir. The place was silent for 18 seconds. If you watch the video, it was silent. Wow. And what's the seventh day of 
creation, rest. Rest. So the music, oh the my music gosh. continued after the piece ended. It was rest. And anyways, I can't come up with this stuff on my own. Like this is not, this is not, you know, this is for me, I wrote this piece and I'm on top of the mountain. And I, I felt like I was being taught and I, my heart was full. I felt the spirit so strong. I felt my savior close. And I still, I still feel that he, you know, that, that he was holding my hand through this journey, holding my hand, no pun intended. Right. Mm -hmm. But it ended. And I thought we did a big video. We did a recording. You can buy a recording of it or listen to an Apple music or whatever. I still get emails about it today. People are, are still moved by it, but I thought, man, this is it. Like the Lord asked me to write this piece. And I know, I know why, because I'm going to be famous now. Like I'm going to be able to do this rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he didn't. I basically built a boat and he said, cross the ocean. <laughs> Across the ocean, you know what, uh, you're going to get sick. Uh, your kids are going to be thrown up over the thing. And, you know, your brothers are going to start dancing and you're going to go in the wrong direction. And then you're going to have to get back on the right direction. And when you get to the promised land, by the way, it's the promised land. I call it the promised land, but that's the wrong name for it because it's basically sucks. You don't have any food. You're going to have to <laughs> garden and um, you got to, you know, you're going to have to endure to the end, buddy. Um, thanks, for, thanks for thanks for the good times. No, so there's, there's not there's not a day that goes by that I don't long to be back there. But I have mm -hmm. a reverence for the enduring of the end part, and I will tell you that my own personal experience that the Lord, I've had many more experiences like that. They're smaller, but He never le He never le leaves us alone. And he He loves us. Mm -hmm. and he wants us to connect with Him, and when we bring forward an offering in faith. He touches our stones and he makes them white. Mm -hmm. And I really, really believe that. I feel like I look back in my life and even these pieces we're preparing next week, just how many tears were spent writing these pieces of just how much pain I've had in my own life. And I sit down at the piano and I play through these pieces that we're doing next week. And just for a moment, I just get, I just get a warm hug, you know, and I get back up and go hang out with my kids mm -hmm. and just do the best you can. But I just, I never want to leave that tree, you know, that, that tree of life, you know, that love of God. So anyways. Wow. Oh my gosh. It's funny because I, like, I love music and Scott too. Like we we, we both resonate with music, you know, um, <laughs> we can greatest showman. All oh day yeah. Long. <laughs> that's, classic. that's classic. We, we love that kind of stuff. Um, but even, even just hearing you speak about it, I feel like I could almost hear it in my mind, you know, like I felt like my soul was resonating with it during a couple different parts there where you mentioned, you know, the, the meaning behind it and the, the way that there was a rise and a fall and an opposition and, and a pull. And I just, oh my gosh, I, I can't help but think about, um, I don't know if you've ever been to it, but in Dallas, there is the, uh, it's like the, the museum of Bible art. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Yeah. I actually did a performance there once. With did the Center you? For okay. and Arts. Yeah. Okay. That's really cool. So I, so my husband and I, we went to it last year and I remember we, we, we walked around and it was really neat seeing the art and everything like that. Then we walked into this one room and instantly the feeling was different. And I don't know if they had this artist, if you know where I'm going with this, but the feeling was instantly different. And I just remember feeling like there was almost like this kind of like heaviness throughout, you know, like it, it was nice. It was, it was good art, but it just, it, it didn't feel so big and inspirational and almost kind of felt like a little, a little scary or a little dark or a little, I don't know. It was, you know, there was art of like uh, demons and angels and the way that they depicted it just kind of felt, you know, just burdensome in a way, but beautiful. Right. You know, then we walk into this one room and immediately I, I told my husband, I said, there's something different about this room, you know, and we're looking at these, these pictures of art and it's the most interesting. It's very modern, very geometric. And there's pictures of Christ and there's pictures of, you know, him, um, 
um, on the boat and walking on water and, and, and I'm like, man, I was like, honey, this is my favorite artist. Like I, like I, I want to get some of his paintings. I wonder if this museum is selling any of them, you know? And, um, and there was one in particular and I looked at the painting and I was just like, oh, like my soul resonated with it. And then I looked at the title of the painting and it said, come unto Christ. And I was like, oh. What? This guy's like got to be Larry. This related right? Or that's what I was saying. I was like, wait a minute. I was like, that's a very interesting <laughs> yeah. phrase to use. So I Googled this artist and sure enough, his name, I don't know if it's pronounced Jorge or George, but um, George uh, Coco yeah. Santan- yep, yep. Santangelo. Yeah, he look- yes. Yeah. He's yeah. amazing. It, I mean, yeah. just so stinking cool. And and it was interesting because I thought afterwards, I thought that's that's really modern art too for it's Christ. very modern. It. It's, and I'm yeah. the funny thing is I'm not usually into like the super modern East. I'm more like farmhouse art, <laughs> you know, like well, I don't know how to explain it. But anyway, that's okay. But it was yeah. my soul resonated with it. And I instantly knew that there was something that was it felt right. Right. Like yeah. it, like the message felt right. That is a message of hope. It's a message of light. It's a message of love. This is the real Christ. He lives and he's there for us. And he did this whole amazing mortal life experience for us. But even before then, he did so much for us and he continues to do for us. And he does it with this love. And it just felt so hopeful to me. And, and so I tell you that because the things that you were saying, the the dichotomy of starting in the Garden of Eden and then having the Garden of Gethsemane and then having the, that Garden of Resurrection, right? Like, like it all exists together. There is, it, it really is not a sequential thing, right? It's not a sequential linear storyline. It all has always been part of the plan. It has always existed in the mind of our Creator and our Heavenly Absolutely. Father. Right. And because it's always existed in him and we're created by him, that means it's always existed in us. And so when our souls hear that, whether we're in a in a Lutheran cathedral somewhere, or we're in an art museum in Dallas, or we're sitting on a podcast just talking about it, yeah, truth will resonate with our with our souls. And so the fact that you're willing to take those talents and like you said, just like the brother of Jared, like bring those stones and say, This is what I have, Lord. Yeah. Make it light make it light, please. You know, this is, this is what I can give to you. And the, the things that heavenly father can do with the things we bring to him is just absolutely beautiful. It gets me so excited and I'm starting to nerd out, but I, but I love hey. it so much. And I just, I, ah, oh. well, Andy, I think I want to change careers after listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I, so every once in a while I'm like, Oh geez. Like I could really <laughs> mind. Yeah. But, but you know what? <laughs> Yeah, I just try to think higher and holier, and it gets me through. Still through those times, and you're just like, I could really use a few extra bucks, but we're doing <laughs> he's always taking care of me. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, wow. I I love man, just I I love the way that you tie music into meaning, and how how things have double meanings or triple meanings, and when you yeah. realize it you have that just uh, that aha moment. And as you were talking about it, just, you know, when you're talking about like the weight, the weight that he felt, but also being resurrected at the same time, like I've never thought of it that way before. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see how you portray that in music. Um, I guess that would be one of my questions is when you picture something or you want to set a stage how do you do that with music? How do you turn a picture into sound? That's such a great question. Um, you know, because for everybody, it's, for everybody kind of interprets, has their own musical depiction of, of Gethsemane. I, like I, I remember once, this, this is so funny. Um, this is a, it's kind of a side story, but don't, don't, don't worry. I'm not going too off tangent here, but I remember I had to play for, <laughs> a funeral service at the Methodist church that I work at, worked at in Denton, Texas. And, mm-hmm. and the lady calls me during the week. She's like, I'm going to do a, a solo arrangement of amazing grace. So I was like, okay. So I, I kind of like kind of worked on Cause she's just like, I was like, do you have any music? She's like, no. I was like, Oh, okay. So I kind of worked with this like little classical version of it to improvise. Mm. I show up and she's just like, um, <laughs> and I, I was like, that's not what I had prepared. Now I love that. 
And I think sometimes as musicians, we get so caught up in like, what's the higher holier music that, that we lose sight of the fact that, that there's, 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 everybody has, the Lord knows each one of us personally. Mm-hmm. So in that moment, I had two choices to make. I could, I could be a, be like, no, we're going to do the classical version, the better version, or mm-hmm. I could just jump in and just go. So I, I decided I'm, I'm going to jump and we're going to, we're going to party. We're going to do this. <laughs> so I did this just rocking amazing grace. I got that. We got done with the performance and man, people went like people were just sobbing. And that was like mm-hmm. a really, that was a game changer for me when I realized like sometimes as a musician, I feel like I get too prideful for like i i've talked to you guys about just the ecstasy of i think with a lot of things there's there's just more to discover like like we're just in different domes right mm-hmm. and that 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 sometimes it's that it's it's okay it's humbling to just recognize that that i in the end you just want people to feel loved and cared and for some yeah. of those people it's hotel california you know, I, I played for a funeral in, in Ogden, Utah, Scott, uh-huh. last week where the, the dad loved, uh, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. So I, played that. I was asked to play that at the funeral and people Aww. just, you know, that's what, that's what they needed. That's what they needed to feel love. And in those moments, Hosanna and Excelsis from Christus ain't going to cut it. That, <laughs> a big, large Catholic art mass, that ain't going to cut it for them. And that's okay. Um, yeah. but, um, your question is how do you depict something like that? And I think it's understanding your audience, but it's also being a good poet. If you, if you really study good poets, they know the repertory. They know John Donne. They know John Milton. They know Shakespeare or um, Christina Rossetti. They know the poetry. They know the wit. Um, mm-hmm. They're familiar with the, um, the puns, the play on words. And so they can take something and drop it in a different context. James Goldberg is, is a brilliant LDS poet, by the way. I don't know if you've ever had him. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but he, he's an incredible Latter-day Saint poet. I feel like he really captures the magic from his – he has a, a Jewish background. And he captures the magic of, magic of Old Testament ideas and whatnot. But I think that's, that's important. And so, yes, there's as a, as a composer, there's tricks and techniques, right? So I've studied so much music. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll listen and I'll be like, Okay, that composer really capsul- encapsulates the crucifixion. Like this, whatever I'm listening to right now, and then I dive in and I study it. I, like I, I, mm-hmm. I break it down. I'm like, what is he doing with the bass line? Or what is she doing with the melody? And what's the, what is the counterpoint? Like how are all those things um, tethering together? Or mm-hmm. think about fabric, uh, whatever. Weaving. Yeah. Weaving. To be- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a professor um weaving tethering you know yeah <laughs> t- tethering i was like i'm like tetherball no no t- um but yeah you know, how it all plays together and then and then i take that back to my own music and make it my own right um and so and, and then also not being afraid to be bold i think sometimes um as latter-day saints we're, we're like, like I remember one, I wrote this piece called Elena the Divine Enfant, which is a beautiful Christmas piece. Uh, he is born the divine Christ child. And I remember it was early when I was composing and I came up with this massive like cluster chord at the pit, this, the climax of the piece. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, dude, my Latter-day Saint friends, this is, they might think I'm evil. Like they might think I've gone <laughs> off the deep end and I've left the church. I get, I actually get a lot of that, by the way. A lot of people oh, no. they hear my music. They, they hear my music. They're like, it's too Catholic. He must not be. And my family will be around him. And they'll be like, oh, I wonder if he's active. <laughs> I'm like, well, I am. So I love it. I love the gospel. But anyways, uh, where was I going with that? Um, about, this um, this piece music. that was all clustered and. Oh yeah, yeah. So I came with this massive, awesome cluster chord. And I loved it, but I was like, oh, is it? I was like, maybe I should just tone it down a little bit. Like, let's take out some of those notes and may not make it so dissonant. And then finally, I was just like, you know what? Life's a party. Let's have some fun. Who cares? Let's make it let's just go crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, I play it today. Everybody goes nuts. Mormons, Catholics, anybody that like, hears that chord, they just go, yeah. It's so <laughs> great. It's right before right before the ending of the piece. And it just, just just halls the pedals are going crazy it's an organ piece and 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 so, so I, I i learned from that thing that not to be afraid of 
like it's just because I put a dissonant chord doesn't mean I'm an evil sinner. Does it make sense? Like it's yeah. okay to mm-hmm. have dark music. I think Nephi teaches us, Lehi teaches us in Second Nephi too, right? That to really understand the light, it's a, it, you. It, the, the light is greater with the darkness, and, and I think you, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to encourage anybody to ex- to explore darkness so they can understand the light. But you've had people on this podcast that have, right? But yeah. I think yeah. there's a you appreciate those beautiful transcendent moments more if the journey mm-hmm. that you went through to get there was a little bit more challenging a little bit more made yeah. you a little bit more uncomfortable yeah 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 it's i it just makes me think of you know in all things there must needs be opposition right so i think that's in everything right like you have to have that pull you have to have that great pull that that tug of war almost to really fully understand like the weight and the light of both so, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Wow. Well, I, I can't wait. I, I've already listened to some of your stuff, but I can't wait to hear more. Um, we are going to have for our listeners, we're going to have um, some of the music put in here that you can listen to either little clips or um, links that you could go to. And if you'd like to, you know, pick up an, is it an album? Is that what you call it? Is it a- yeah, I mean, uh, people. I, I don't think people buy CDs anymore. Uh, you can, but but no. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, yeah. It's on. It's on Apple. You can listen to creatures on Apple Music, but I mostly have YouTube videos, so you can find what you like on there. Awesome. I have a ton of a ton of YouTube videos, um, and and some of my music's really wild. Like like it's 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 art music. It's it's like an mm-hmm. abstract painting. So some of it, yeah. some of it's pretty hard. And that, so, like we did one of my pieces today, at Good Friday, and yeah. I got a lot of funny comments. So, so sometimes it's a little bit, you know, so, but th- then I have a lot of pieces that are, you know, I just have all over the spectrum and I, I just love writing and, and I've, I've learned so much about my relationship with my heavenly father through composing. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. So. I love it. That's awesome. But yeah, so YouTube videos or on my website, whatever. whatever okay. Whatever perfect. We'll make sure we put all those links in the description. So if anyone wants to do a little bit yeah. more research and everything like that, they'll be able to, to find you and find your, your art. <laughs> so, wow. I love it. Yeah. And that's so cool that, you know, your upcoming event and the concert. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so excited. We're taking my kids in New York for the first time. So, you know, pray for us. Wow. It's going to be, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be wild. Yeah, they're yeah. Gonna have a Rachel, Rachel's been texting me back and forth and she's been singing some stuff. Uh, and I mean, Gosh, man, she, she's a once in a lifetime talent and she's delightful and she loves the pieces. It's more than I can ask for. She, she's really getting into them. And I'm just so thrilled. That's amazing. So, wow. Yeah. Carnegie Hall, uh, man. Like, I'm telling like, you, that's it. It feels like you've made it, right? Like, yeah. There's certain things when you, I, wow, dude. Like, that's just so cool. Yeah. And it, it's so, it is, it's, it's such a wonderful thing. But, you know, like, I recognize, like, It's a great experience, but when you walk, once you walk away, there's things, you know, there's things that are, I, I've learned as through this process that relationships are the most, you know, most important thing you walk away and it's going to be over at some point. And, and maybe mm-hmm. there's going to be another Carnegie all down the road or another, you know, in another awesome venue somewhere down the road. And there might not be. So I'm going to mm-hmm. enjoy it while I got it. And then yep. when the dust settles, I'm not going to get offended that <laughs> we don't get any more performances or. Nothing happens. We, that's part of that endure the end thing. I'm just going to get my boat and just uh, keep trucking, you know, and try it. Okay. I'm working on another big oratorio right now. That's going to be, it's going to be stunning. Um, uh, that I, I'm, I'm super excited about uh, a massive seven movement choir work with two double choirs. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I don't want to, <laughs> I, I want to take more time. I, I can talk about it. <laughs> oh, Andy, it has been just an absolute pleasure having you on today as our guest. We are so, so grateful to you for not only like coming on here and sharing these these insights in your your music with us, but just for like sharing your talent with the world. I definitely think yeah. that, um, you know, the reason why Scott uh, wanted to start this podcast in the in the beginning was because he really wanted to share light. 
And there are so many ways for us to be able to do that. And so I love that the light that you're sharing is unique to your talents, but that it's reaching people all over the place. And I'm, you know, really happy, honestly, that that it can be found in other faiths, you know, that, that yeah. those who <clears throat> are more used to those things, it's planting those little seeds, right? So when the time comes for them to hear the truth and to, or, or to expand on the truth that they already know, like you, you have no idea how much impact from your music is going to do for, you know, for their future testimonies and stuff. So thank you for being you. Even well, if you're not you. Andrew Lloyd Webber, I like hey, Sir hey. Andy Lloyd. <laughs> you're good people in my book. <laughs> Air guitar, I got it. I still got it. No, Andrew Lloyd, Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Webber, he's the real deal. Well, I yeah. think that you both are. So, <laughs> awesome. well, I, I appreciate you guys doing this. This is such a cool, such a cool podcast. You got, I, I've seen some of them, and you, you, you bring in some really fun people. So. Yeah. Um, just, just grateful to be a part of it and, and just wish you, wish you both just tremendous success in what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, man. Well, thank you for everyone that's been watching this episode and hopefully, you know, this has inspired you and helped you to, you know, get some of that light and, um, hope. And, you know, if you have any, um, you know, any desire to share light, share your light, share your light, <laughs> light, <laughs> um, go to latterdaylights.com and share your story with us and let's have you on as well. Yeah, absolutely. Just make sure that you, uh, since we're talking about sharing, do your five second missionary work, click that share button. We want to make sure that we are able to get Andy's story out there. Uh, also definitely if you guys are in the area or you just really want to have an impromptu trip, go check out, uh, the concert at Carnegie hall, April 9th. Um, don't skip out on general conference this weekend. <laughs> Maybe you make some trips. Maybe you watch general conference when you're in New York and then you get to go enjoy, you know, some amazing music outside of general conference at the concert. So, uh, be sure to check the links and stuff like that in the description. Like I said, we're going to have music on there. We're going to have uh, Andy's website. We're going to have Carnivica Hall. We will put all out there um, and we would love for you guys to to just get this out there, share it. Let Andy know, maybe after you listen to some of his stuff, let him know what you thought. Let him know which pieces spoke to you the most and uh, maybe you have ideas for him. What's Andy's next big piece going to be? I don't know, but you might. So <laughs> leave a comment. Let us know you know, what you guys thought of today's episode. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe you can do yeah. a mashup Andy, like Ooh. cold play and, uh, you know, something to do with the apostles. I got a piano right here. Um, I got you covered. I, I, I do a lot of, I do a lot of cold play covers for sure. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cold play and the greatest showman. That's what Scott and I need. No. <laughs> I'm, listen, I think it can work, you know. I, I think it can too. Because <laughs> you're a showman full of stars. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, guys. Uh, thanks well, again, Andy. Yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And um, until next week, we hope you guys have a beautiful conference weekend. I hope that those who are able to make it to Carnegie Hall uh, to support Andy in this and Rachel in this as well, and all those who participated in, in creating and, and executing, you know, all of these numbers. I hope you guys are just filled with a spirit and that you're able to uh, feel the Lord close by. And uh, with that... I think that's all we have for today's show. So we will talk to you guys on Latter-day Lights. See you later. Take care.